Hello and welcome to the second part of our mini-series on the three new heroes in Hearthstone. Last week we covered Magni and this week we'll be placing Illyria Windrunner under the spotlight. Illyria's race is probably one of the most interesting and prominent evolutions in the Warcraft universe, it now being one of the least united, split by disagreements and feuds, though I'm sure many other lore enthusiasts could argue with me on this point. It's theorised that the Elves began life as Dark Trolls that settled around the Well of Eternity. When the Titans shaped Azeroth, at the very centre of the landmass, they created the Well. This font of arcane power was placed upon the world to help nurture and encourage life, making sure the world they had shaped became lush and vibrant. The Dark Trolls began to rapidly evolve by being in such close proximity to the well. Their skin tone changed, they grew taller, they became stronger, more intelligent and were gifted with immortality. They called themselves the Keldorai children of the stars and these were the very first of the Night Elves. As time progressed, Night Elf society split in two, the Highborn emerging as the upper class that the rest of the populace looked up to. The Night Elves had also been able to harness the Well's power, wielding arcane magic to their needs, with wistful abandon. However, this unmonitored use of magic led to Azeroth being discovered by the Burning Legion, led by the corrupted titan Sargeras. While the rest of his kind look to order, Sargeras seeks to bring destruction and chaos to the universe. The Night Elven Queen Ashara and her Highborn, at the promise of power, align themselves with the Legion. The rest of the Night Elves and many other of the races upon Azeroth were able to join together to defeat the Legion before Sargeras was able to manifest in their world. The destruction of the portal meant to bring Sargeras over caused the Great Sundering, splitting the world into the four continents known today. At the centre of the Sundering were Ashara and her most trusted Highborn. Ashara shielded them as the waters of the Well of Eternity engulfed them, but even her power could not save them. Before she succumbed, a mysterious voice whispered to her. It wasn't the end. She could become more powerful and serve a new master. Ashara's shield gave way, and those caught in the waters would mutate into the sea-dwelling Naga. To this day, the Naga still have a passionate hatred for the Night Elves. The Highborn that remained in Night Elven society were forbidden from using arcane magic, so as not to draw the Legion to their world again. If they did, the sentence was death. Having grown accustomed to the arcane in their lives, many Highborn found they could not live without it, and rebelled, seeing the arcane as their birthright. In defiance, the Highborn unleashed a magical storm over Ashenvale, the Night Elves' ancestral home, under the command of Dathramar Sunstrider. Not having the heart to execute so many of their kin, the Night Elves exiled the Highborn responsible, sending them to the east across the sea. In the Eastern Kingdoms, the Highborn eventually founded their kingdom of Quel'Thalas, surrounded by a magical barrier so that the Legion could not discover their liberal use of the arcane. In their new home, these elves' appearance changed. They scaled down in height, and their skin went from a deep violet to a pale white. They became known as the High Elves, the variety of elves to which Illyria belongs. Settling in the Eastern Kingdoms was not easy for the High Elves. As they were trying to find a home, a fierce, violent rivalry broke out between the Elves and the Armani Forest Trolls that occupied the area. This tension was pushed to its limits when the Elves founded their Kingdom of Quel'Thalas atop an ancient sacred troll city. The Armani attacked in force, outnumbering the Elves ten to one, but through use of magic, the Elves were able to save themselves and push back the Trolls. After this, the Elves remained in relative peace for 4,000 years, but the Armani, filled with resentment toward the race, plotted the Elves' downfall. 2,500 years before the first Orcish invasion, the Armani launched their attack. Thus begun the Troll Wars. 
Some sources state that Illyria was alive during this conflict. While she did make her name as an exceptional troll hunter, it is unlikely she lived at this time. The maximum lifespan of a High Elf tends to be a little over 3,000 years. This would have meant that if Illyria participated in this conflict, she would most likely be nearing the end of her life. When elves reach the twilight of their years, they show the same signs of age as a human would. Illyria, however, still looks very youthful. In this war, the trolls gain the upper hand over the elves, constant besiegement slowly wearing down the kingdom of Quel'Thalas. Desperate not to fall to the trolls, the elves sought allies and found them in the humans. Once a tribal culture, many humans have been united to become the first human kingdom, Arathor. The Arathi pledged themselves to the elves' cause in exchange for a hundred of their men being tutored in the arcane. With help from the humans, the kingdom of Quel'Thalas was saved. The elves owed the humans a debt of gratitude and the great Armani Empire was in disarray thus ending the longest single war in Azeroth's history. In the relative peace before the first invasion of the Orcs, Illyria was born, along with her two sisters, Sylvanas and Verissa, and the youngest, their brother Lyrith, Illyria being the eldest. As I mentioned previously, Illyria's early history is kind of muddy, possibly participating in the Troll Wars, but her age making this quite unlikely. What is certain is that each of the Windrunner sisters were honoured for their great contribution to the defence of Quel'Thalas, Illyria later earning the position of captain and Sylvanas the title of general amongst the elven rangers. The rangers are few in number, but represent the very best of the elves' archers. They have an intimate understanding for the wilderness of Lordaeron and are unequalled in the skills of marksmanship and scouting. Unlike a lot of elves, rangers prefer to rely on their martial prowess rather than magic. The rangers form up the organisation known as the Farstriders. Though the Armani Empire was defeated and a shadow of what it used to be, the trolls were not without fangs. An inspirational leader had risen among them and united what was left of their scattered empire. Zul'jin led the trolls in several daring raids on the outskirts of Quel'Thalas, often striking and leaving before the elves had a chance to respond. It is quite likely around this time that Illyria made a name for herself, dispatching many trolls. But Zul'jin would remain a thorn in the side of the kingdom right up to and during the Orcish Wars. When the orcs first invaded Azeroth, crossing over from Draenor through the Dark Portal, they made quick work of the human kingdom of Stormwind. Those that survived fled to the human kingdom of Lordaeron. The king of Lordaeron, Terranus, saw the great threat the orcs posed to the entirety of Azeroth and joined the human kingdoms together in order to fight the orcish horde. As well as this, Terranus reached out to the elves, invoking the debt of gratitude the elves owed the Arathi. Anduin Lothar was one of the few that survived the destruction of Stormwind and was the last surviving member of the Arathi bloodline. With his presence, the elves were compelled to aid the humans. Gnomes and the dwarves of the Bronzebeard and Wildhammer clans also pledged themselves to the war effort, creating the Alliance of Lordaeron. The elves, however, were the least committed of all the races. They did not see the orcs as a great threat like the others did. Seeing an excuse to clear their debt, the elven ruler Anasterian Sunstrider sent a meagre force to aid the alliance. Illyria disagreed with her king and thought the orcs may in fact pose a serious threat to the elven kingdom if left unchecked. She chose to lead her rangers to aid the alliance of Lordaeron, despite no order being given to her to do so. During the Second War, Illyria worked closely with the Paladin Torellian and the Archmage Kagga, following the orders of the alliance's high commander, Anduin Lothar. At first, the group fought alongside Lothar, aiding their leader in key victories over the orcs at the towns of Hillsbrad and Southshore. Lothar's forces pursued the orcs into the hinterlands, suspecting the orcs were gearing up for an attack on Airy Peak, home to the Wildhammers. The main bulk of the orc forces, however, had not travelled to the hinterlands. 
Those forces were to lure the alliance. The main force was heading northwards to aid their new allies, the Trolls, in an attack on Quel'Thalas. When Lothar realised what the Orcs had done, he sent Torellian, Illyria and Khadgar with an army to intercept the Orcs before they burnt Quel'Thalas to the ground. The army was too late. The Orcs had captured Caer Darrow and the Elven runestone within. This runestone, which was essential in maintaining the Elves' barrier that hid their magic from the Legion, was used by the Orcish warlock Gul'dan to create Ogre Magi to join the forces of the Horde. From here, the Orcs went on to take the city of Stratholme, now poised to launch a full-on assault on Quel'Thalas. The borders of Quel'Thalas were decimated by the Horde, and they were able to cut a path through the territory until they reached the elven capital of Silvermoon. Illyria, Torellian, Khadgar, Sylvanas, and a future leader of the elves, Lothamar Theron, did their best to halt the Horde's unrelenting assault. Despite the Horde now knocking at his front door, it still took an action from Illyria to convince Anastarian to fight back with the full military force of the Elves. She rode to the capital of Silvermoon and met with the King, but he was still reluctant to commit the Elves. In response, Illyria threw down the head of an Armani troll at Anastarian's feet. Filled with rage that their ancient enemy had joined the Horde, Anastarian committed the full force of the Elves to the war. Since many Orc forces had been recalled by their war chief Orgrim Doomhammer to assault the city of Lordaeron, the Elves and the humans were able to push back the Horde presence in Quel'Thalas. Many a life being lost. One of those lives lost would be Illyria's brother, Lyrith as well as another 17 of her bloodline. Devastated by the loss of her brother and the defilement of the woods that surrounded her people's kingdom, Illyria sought comfort in Torellian. During this brief encounter, she fell pregnant with her son, Arator. Illyria, the very next day, shrugged away Torellian, who deeply loved the elf, in order to pursue her revenge. The assault on Lordaeron failed due to infighting amongst the Horde, and a majority of the Orcs were driven back through the Dark Portal. The portal was destroyed, but a small rift remained between the two worlds. A lot of Orcs that remained behind were placed in internment camps. Illyria had become consumed by her hatred for the Orcs, and had come to regard the race as little more than vermin that needed to be eradicated from the face of Azeroth. With a small group of rangers at her command, she travelled to the Human Lands, where she sought out and dispatched any remaining pockets of Orcish resistance, dealing with them swiftly and efficiently. Over this time, the Elves once again became more aloof from the Alliance, blaming the poor organisation of the Human Command as the reason for the destruction of their lands. King Terranus was quick to point out that without many human lives being sacrificed, the Elves' kingdom would have fallen. But Anastarian chose to yet again concern himself with only Elven affairs. Illyria and a few other Elves remained with the Alliance. Two years after the event known as the Second War had ended, having earned her captain title, Illyria met with her old friend Kagga at Nethergard Keep, a stronghold that had been created to monitor the small rift that remained between the worlds. Kagga informed Illyria that the portal was once again widening and requested her aid. He asked that the Elf find Danath, Trollbane and Torellian, as they would be essential in order to muster the Alliance forces against the coming Orc attack. Given her history with Torellian, Illyria reluctantly accepted and headed to the rebuilt city of Stormwind to recruit the humans. The Orcs, under the command of Ner'zhul, attacked Azeroth again. This was in order to steal artefacts to open portals to different worlds on Draenor for the Orcs to conquer. An expedition was put together to chase the Orcs back through the Dark Portal and put an end to the Orcish threat once and for all. The Alliance had been able to find out Nezul's plan through Orcish prisoners. Torellian reasoned that no other world should suffer as theirs did. 
Illyria committed herself and her rangers to the expedition, eager to exact vengeance upon the orcs for Quel'Thalas. Illyria had always worn a necklace given to her by her parents, a beautiful piece adorned with a ruby, a sapphire and an emerald. Before leaving for Draenor, Illyria had this necklace melted down into three separate pieces. She kept the emerald, gifted the sapphire to Sylvanas and the ruby to Varisa, a display of compassion that had become so rare for Illyria in recent times. She also sent a message along with the necklaces, to her sisters and her parents, of where she was going and why, to keep her world and others safe. The forces crossed over to the orcish world of Draenor, Cadgar, Danath and Curridan Wildhammer joining Illyria, Torellian and their men on their quest. Illyria was disgusted by the orcish homeworld, the planet had been abused, life had wilted and a path made of the bones of Draenei branched out from the dark portal. Illyria had always admired nature and respected it. The army created the Fort of Honor Hold so that they had a base of operations upon Draenor. The Hold was regularly assaulted by the Orcs, but never in great numbers. This was Nezal's attempt to distract them and bide himself time. Kagga was able to discover why Nezal had not yet opened the portals. In order to perform the ritual the Orc needed, the stars had to be correctly aligned. The race was on to hunt down Nezal. Torellian mustered his men, but told Illyria to stay behind. Torellian still deeply loved Illyria, and knew that in her current revenge fueled mindset, it was highly likely that Illyria would recklessly get herself killed. Besides, he needed someone to stay behind to defend on a hold. Illyria refused, her cold demeanour broke down and she confessed that she too still loved Torellian and could not stay behind and lose another that she loved. All the years she had been seeking vengeance were to distract her from accepting the deaths of those that she had loved. Having allowed herself to finally grieve and her relationship started anew with Torellian, a level-headed Illyria was ready to stop Nerzul's plan. After breaking through the orc stronghold of Hellfire Citadel, Illyria sent most of her rangers under the command of her second, Talthrasar, to join Danath and Kurdran, entailing their Zul. Illyria, Torellian and Khadgar went off in search of the Skull of Gul'dan, one of the artifacts Nerzul had taken from Azeroth, that now lay in the clutches of the black dragon aspect Deathwing. Deathwing had allied with the Orcs and travelled to Draenor to populate it with black dragons. Luckily for the three companions, the Gron, led by Grawl, were not about to have their homes snatched away from them. With assistance from Grawl, the three were able to force Deathwing to retreat, and they retrieved the Skull of Gul'dan. While the army had made a valiant effort to chase down their Zul, they ultimately failed, though several key Orcish leaders did fall. The clan leader Kilrog Deadeye fell to Danath, and Torellian was able to slay the powerful Death Knight Terran Gorfiend, able to fight through the spellcaster's sinister magics, fueled by his love for Illyria. Ner'zhul opened his portals, and another race against time had begun. The chaotic magics that Ner'zhul had created began to rip the world of Draenor apart. The Alliance forces had to race back to the Dark Portal to seal it, otherwise the destruction befalling Draenor would also spill over into Azeroth. The Alliance made it in time to the portal, but they had been trailed by the Orcs left behind by Ner'zhul. They were desperate to escape the grisly fate of their world and cross over into Azeroth. Illyria, Torellian, Danath, Kurdran, and their forces held off the Orcs while Kagga completed the ritual to seal the portal. They succeeded, saving Azeroth. Fortunately for them, before Draenor tore itself asunder, a small rift opened up near the adventurers. They stepped into it, and shielded by Kagga, they managed to survive the calamity that befell Draenor. When they stepped out of the rift, they gazed over what Draenor had become, the shattered world, Outland, and returned to what was left of Honor Hold. 
back in Azeroth, it was presumed that those that went to Draenor had died. To honour the heroes, statues were erected in Stormwind for Kadgar, Kurdran, Danath, Torellian, and Illyria. Upon the plaque beneath Illyria's statue, the following words are written. Ranger Captain, Illyria Windrunner, renowned troll hunter of Quel'Thalas, lead scout and intelligence agent of the Alliance expedition that marched into the Orc homeworld of Draenor, presumed decease. Your heart flew straight as any arrow upon the wind, sister. You were the brightest of our order. You were the most beloved of our kin, Sylvanas Windrunner, Ranger General of Quel'Thalas. When the Dark Portal reopened once again for the Burning Crusade expansion, many heroes travelled to Outland. This included Illyria's son, Arator, now a paladin in his father's footsteps, desperately searching for his mother and father. Kagga, Danath and Kurdran were all found, but despite searching the entirety of Outland, no trace of Illyria and Torellian could be seen. Due to their deep love for one another, it is presumed that if you find one of them, you find the other. If and when Illyria finally does return to the Warcraft storyline, she will receive quite the shock, as a majority of her people were killed during the invasion of the Undead Scourge. Most of those that survived would go on to call themselves Blood Elves, and later join the Horde. Her sisters now fight on opposite sides. Varisa remained with the few elves that stayed in the Alliance, and is now leader of an order known as the Silver Covenant. She too has experienced great loss, losing her husband Ronin. Sylvanas was slain by the Death Knight Arthas, and raised again as a Banshee. She later broke free of his control, and now leads the Undead Forsaken. In Undeath, Sylvanas has shown herself to be cold and merciless, and many fear that she will lose her mind and sweep across Azeroth like the Scourge did before. Sylvanas did show a rare glimmer of emotion, when presented with the necklace Illyria gifted her that she had lost when killed. Perhaps Illyria is the only one who can prevent Sylvanas' descent into madness. So there you have it, the tale of the new hunter, Illyria Windrunner. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, like, subscribe, and sharing it around really helps the channel out. Thank you very much. All the artists I've been able to find are credited in the description below, so check them out. Next time, we give Medivh a look. But until then, 
happy hearthstoning guys